Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Robert Miller. I'm an associate professor of law here at Villanova Law School, and I'm the associate director and acting executive director of the Matthew J. Ryan Center for the Study of Free Institutions and the Public Good. On behalf of the Ryan Center, the Villanova Law School, the Villanova College of Arts and Sciences, the Federalist Society, and our other co-sponsoring institutions, I welcome you to the Ryan Center's 2010 Constitution Day Symposium. We have an outstanding collection of speakers for you today. Uh, later, Professor Richard Beeman of the University of Pennsylvania will be delivering our keynote address. Uh, our other primary speakers uh, include Professor Viet Din from Georgetown University, Professor Vince Blasi from the Columbia Law School, Professor Samuel Asakharov from the New York University Law School, and Professor John McGinnis from the Northwestern Law School. Uh, responding to them, we'll have Professor Tabitha Abu El Haj from the Drexel Law School, a true rising star in the area of constitutional law. Villanova's own Professor Colleen Sheehan from the Department of Political Science, the founder of the Ryan Center, uh, as well as Villanova Law Professors Penelope Pether and Tuan Samahone. Before we begin, there are certain administrative matters uh, I want to call to your attention. First, we have a very large group today. This room seats 135, but we will have more people here today than that. There are overflow rooms, rooms 201 and 203 upstairs where this event is being simulcast. So uh, if it turns out you lose your seat here around lunchtime, there are other places you can sit upstairs in 201 and 202. Uh, I'm sorry, 201 and 203. Uh, we're also broadcasting live on the web today. So if you look at the Villanova homepage, there should be an icon to click and you can watch us live uh, on the web. Uh, second, attorneys who are present today uh, can receive continuing legal education credit, five continuing legal education credits uh, in exchange for a modest fee of $50, but you have to complete the forms. They were available at the registration table and you have to complete them and return them to us to get your CLE credit. So if you're an attorney and you want that credit, please complete the forms. <coughs> uh, also, uh, there are forms outside about the Ryan Center. We would be very happy if you would join our mailing list so that we can invite you to the future events the Ryan Center is going to hold on October 4th. Professor Robert George, the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University, will be here speaking on God, natural law, and human dignity. On October 18th, Professor Harry Jaffer from Claremont will be speaking on classical philosophy and the American founding. If you join our mailing list, we would be very happy to invite you uh, to those events. So you can join uh, the Ryan Center on the web or by filling out and returning one of the forms available on the tables outside. Uh, finally, the Ryan Center has a very strict policy of beginning and ending on time. Uh, this, the, event, the times in your schedule we will adhere to strictly. We do that because we realize people have other places to be and they're often counting on us to begin and end on time. So uh, I ask for your cooperation in that regard. When we say that we're going to return from a break at a certain time, we mean it. We will start speaking uh, at the times indicated. So your cooperation there is very much appreciated. With that, we are ready to begin. And it's my honor to introduce uh, one of my senior colleagues who will be moderating the first panel. This is Professor Patrick McKinley Brennan, the John F. Scarper Chair in Catholic Legal Studies here at Villanova University. Professor Brennan. Good morning. It's a privilege to join in welcoming you all to our Constitution Day Symposium and to introduce its first panel. I had the privilege of reading in advance a precis of each of the two principal papers for this morning's panel. And at one point in his, Professor Blasey speaks of originalists of the old school. The implication then is that there exist, ironically, self-styled originalists who are at the same time new school. It's a tangled web being woven. True cultural conservatives of the old and only school that is truly culturally conservative 
find all of this rather mind-boggling, as if we who live late in the day could just make up what law really is. To object, as I do, to defining law on the fly will put one at cross purposes with those I suspect Professor Blasey has in mind as originalists of the new school. Those, that is, who look for, as he says, the quote, one dimensional public meaning of a constitutional provision, close quote. As Justice Souter once wrote for the court, quote, Justice Scalia's first priority over the years has been to limit and simplify, close quote. Because on that occasion, Justice Souter was describing the poster child for the new school originalist in a statutory context, Justice Souter justified the court's 8-1 non-simplifying approach on the ground that it ran afoul of Congress's intent, which was fair enough, in my view. But what mutatis mutandis of the Constitution? One of the many virtues of Professor Blasey's paper that you're about to hear, I submit, is that it refuses to twist the Constitution, even for arguably noble reasons, having to do with the deepest commitments of conservatives in the face of culture that has come unhinged with the aid of what is often referred to, unhelpfully in my judgment, as judicial activism, into a charter for simplifications that are false to what Joseph Vining famously referred to as the legal form of thought, a form of thought that leaves nothing out and resists the lie that saying what the Constitution means is no more difficult than agglomerating public meanings of terms as they appeared in contemporary dictionaries. Professor Din operates in a similarly nuanced spirit, it seems to me, as he discerns the patterns in the Supreme Court's recent response to the Bush administration's war paradigm approach to the new terrorism and to the administration's correlative, expansive assertions of executive power to give effect to that paradigm. It was in this context, in the Hamdi case, you will recall, that Justice Scalia's frequent fellow traveler, Justice Thomas, was alone in dissenting on the ground that the court should uphold the government's power to hold enemy combatants indefinitely without judicial review. The great simplifier, by contrast, dissented, joined by Justice Stevens, not a simplifier, arguing that Hamdi was entitled to release under a writ of habeas corpus unless the government promptly brought criminal charges or Congress suspended the great writ. Justice Scalia mocked the majority's opinion by Justice O'Connor for adopting, and I quote, a Mr. Fixit approach. The unusual, and some might say unholy, alliance of Scalia and Stevens is illuminated by Professor Din as he tracks and draws the lessons of Justice Stevens' important contribution across the entire range of cases responding to the Bush War on Terror. With an especially attentive eye on what we might refer to as the interpretive virtues that are being commended by the justices and by our speakers today, then, let us listen now first to Professor Din, Professor of Law in Georgetown Law Center. After the break, to Professor Blasey, the Corliss Lamont Professor of Civil Liberties in the Columbia Law School. And finally, to the reply from my distinguished colleague, Penelope Pether, Professor of Law at Villanova. Just as one person's modus ponens is another's modus tollens, one interpreter's virtue may be another's vice. We need to distinguish carefully, and this conference and this panel are aides in assisting us to do just that. Professor Din. Thank you very much. I'm afraid the introduction is going to be a lot better than my uh, the principal speech, so I apologize in advance. I'm very humbled to be here and honored to be here, obviously. I apologize and very much regret not uh, being able to the uh, to attend the rest of the symposium, but I have another commitment for uh, Constitution Day. I think that the, uh, what you described as Professor Blasey's contribution is, uh, um, suggests to be a very uh, interesting uh, discussion. Sam, of course, is a, a great thinker and uh, 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 and a uh, uh, great mentor, so I, th uh, I regret not being here for uh, to participate in the rest of the, the uh, symposium, but have to leave after um, uh, our morning session. Uh, what I want to start, um, basically, uh, in a much more mundane fashion than the, the uh, than the interpretive, cultural, and philosophical the, 
uh, notions that uh, uh, Professor Brennan had introduced in introducing Professor Blasey's uh, the, uh, remarks. And I want to take us back uh, for the last 10 years or so to the, the, uh, the very fairly practical application of uh, the laws of war or the, uh, the laws of crime and punishment uh, to the post 9-11 response and, and more specifically how the courts have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, adjudicated and opined on the uh, executive's assertions of power and the movement between these two the, uh, paradigms. After 9-11, it is now no longer uh, 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 a matter of private information but rather quite public discussion. Uh, the administration and the executive branch very clearly articulated a prevention uh, imperative. Uh, that is, uh, those of us, and including me, in the, who was working at the Department of Justice at the time, uh, uh, who were in government, saw our charge after 9-11 uh, to, was to prevent the, uh, another attack on the American homeland uh, because of the fear of the, uh, not only the human cost, but the institutional cost uh, 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 to America of a, secondary, uh, of a secondary attack. One can imagine the hysteria and the fear that uh, followed 9-11, and we only imagine the worst uh, uh, in terms of uh, our institutions and the, the uh, popular response to another terrorist attack. Uh, and so we were working very, very hard in order to the, the, uh, prevent such another attack, and the president uh, very clearly, and later more uh, concretely, uh, stated the prevention uh, paradigm. And in, this prevent, in articulating this prevention paradigm, the president obviously acted in both halves of his uh, uh, executive authority. He asserted uh, quite strongly his power as commander in chief, uh, obviously in uh, uh, pursuant to UN resolution to attack Afghanistan and then uh, uh, later uh, to attack Iraq. Uh, and also his power as uh, uh, chief law enforcement officer in order to uh, 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 adopt uh, our strategies uh, on law enforcement in order to meet the ongoing and uh, at the time persistent threat uh, of terror. Uh, and at times, uh, switch hats between, uh, between the two. Uh, the, if I may, the, if I may um, digress for a moment and uh, 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 bring up the story of uh, Jose Padilla, the, the, the for example. Uh, Jose Padilla was arrested uh, uh, initially in uh, uh, the, the in Chicago the, the, the for a uh, uh, for a plot and, and uh, detained by U.S. Department of Justice at the Metropolitan Detention Center in uh, the Southern District of New York uh, the for uh, as a domestic the, the criminal uh, and I recall this very vividly the, uh, that as the Attorney General was flying over the, from uh, uh, Washington D.C. to a conference in Moscow the decision was made that he would be transferred to uh, the, the uh, Department of Defense, uh, obviously with fairly uh, rigorous and vigorous uh, uh, objections from the uh, from the Department of uh, the, of Justice, and uh, so 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 significant that the Attorney General actually had a press conference at the airport in Moscow uh, to great anger and uh, consternation within the uh, within the the, uh, the administration and the and the White House. But that underscore that decision underscores uh, ultimately uh, the, the choice of the, the president. Uh, as both the su as the supervisor of both the attorney general and the secretary of defense, uh, the, the, the to make a de determination as to which uh, paradigm uh, to uh, detain a particular uh, person, uh, whether or not it would be pursuant to the laws of war, uh, or whether or not it would be for pro uh, prosecution under our domestic uh, the criminal law, uh, and uh, uh, the, there are different considerations that go into each. Uh, and different legal implications uh, that attach uh, to that uh, to that decision, uh, and the implications, the legal implications, uh, are becoming clearer and clearer. Because unlike the days after 9/11, uh, now we sit with the benefit of uh, a number of Supreme Court decisions uh, adjudicating primarily uh, the laws of war as it relates to uh, enemy combatant detention, uh, especially for those who are detained. Uh, uh, the, the in the United States uh, the, and, and uh, can therefore be subject to United States criminal, uh, criminal law. Uh, and I think that uh, it is not an understatement to say that with respect to the laws of war governing detention of enemy combatants, no justice has done more to restrict executive authority uh, than Justice Stevens. 
uh, do you recall that the first of these decisions uh, handed down the same day as uh, Hamdi uh, versus Rumsfeld, uh, uh, to which uh, Professor Brennan had already alluded, uh, was Rasul. Uh, and Rasul stood for the proposition that notwithstanding that Guantanamo Bay is not within the United States geographical jurisdiction, because it's actually within the, the jurisdiction of Cuba, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and notwithstanding other uh, the, uh, World War II era precedents, most significantly Eisenstrager, uh, the court would have habeas jurisdiction to review uh, the legality of detentions of any combatants held uh, in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the next case uh, the, 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 uh, that comes up, obviously, that is relevant is Hamdan uh, versus Rumsfeld, which uh, the, uh, the, uh, tests the question as to whether uh, 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 Saddam Hussein's driver, or was that Iran, uh, the Osama the, uh, bin Laden's driver, uh, was subject to and can be tried for a military commission uh, uh, established by the, uh, by executive order. Uh, and Justice Stevens again uh, opined for the court that the, the Geneva Convention uh, restricts both the substance and the procedure uh, applicable to the military commission and Hamdan uh, not uh, the, having been detained and charged for the, uh, uh, the violations prior to the, the AUMF, the, the authorized for the use of military force and for uh, activities <coughs> that are not in the context of the theory of war could not be tried uh, as a violations of uh, the laws of war and so therefore uh, should not be subject to a military uh, commission. Uh, of course, the most recent and most celebrated and contested uh, uh, opinion uh, dealing with this was Boumediene in which Justice Stevens again, uh, uh, contrary to the, the several statements of Congress, uh, attempted to strip jurisdiction uh, 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 under, habeas, under the habeas corpus statute uh, from the federal courts over cases arising, from, uh, arising out of and challenging the detention of military combatants in Guantanamo Bay asserts that uh, the courts indeed uh, does have the, the, uh, the, the authority uh, to, uh, uh, to hear such cases because to deny jurisdiction would effectively uh, uh, be a, uh, be a uh, um, uh, a suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, which uh, Congress did not intend, uh, intend to do. Uh, in this, I think he has been very, very clear and very, very consistent uh, the, in his silent, uh, the, uh, the, uh, silent uh, um, assent to uh, Justice Scalia's very clear and very simplifying dissent uh, in the Hamdi v. The, uh, v. Rumsfeld case. And there, the, uh, the, the vision, uh, as articulated by Justice Scalia, uh, but agreed to by his infrequent traveler uh, and colleague, Justice Stevens, is that the, the, there, there are two worlds, uh, the world of criminal law and the world of war. And with respect to domestic detention, there is no latter world. It is all criminal law, except for the very narrow instances under which Congress has formally and officially suspended the writ of habeas corpus. There, is, there are no two hats. And, uh, the, and you cannot, the, 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 uh, you cannot uh, violate the rights of American citizens and those detained on uh, U.S. soil uh, the, to a criminal the, the trial, the attendant uh, uh, to which the full panoply of 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendment rights uh, uh, simply by asserting uh, the law of war jurisdiction over the body of this the, the detainee. I think that's a very clear vision, one that obviously Justice Stevens uh, 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 accepted uh, and uh, uh, these latter cases uh, seem to uh, uh, indicate his, uh, his vision that even in the law of war detention applicable to non-U.S. citizens held outside the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, territory, there are significant limitations on executive assertions <coughs> of, law of law of war authority to detain uh, the, uh, enemy combatants. All of which is, uh, uh, I think, fairly consistent with the narrative of the post-9-11 narrative of the court or at least the court led by uh, Justice Stevens uh, of trying to restrain uh, uh, executive assertions of extraordinary power uh, uh, that uh, while they may have been consistent with the authorities under the Civil War and World War II is no, lo no longer consonant uh, with constitutional values as it uh, 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 applies to the, the war against terror. <laughs> What, we, uh, what interests me in this uh, the, 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 uh, for today uh, is the flip side of the equation, which is the heretofore really untested territory as to the criminal law paradigm on, uh, uh, with respect to the war on terror. And, I, uh, and, and that may surprise you all and say, well, criminal law is criminal law. 
you know, why, why is there you know, why is there a need for testing? Well, I agree with that, but you know, we uh, the uh, the United States government, uh, we uh, really redefined the criminal law also uh, after the, the after 9/11. So so just think of the prevention imperative, right? If you have a prevention imperative, there are only two ways to prevent uh, the, 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 by the, uh, the, by detention. And one is the law of war paradigm, which has been significantly circumscribed. The other one is to expand the criminal law and the authorization for detention uh, there, uh, uh, there under to what we would normally not consider to be your traditional crimes. And so uh, the, material, the material support statute, as, we, uh, as amended by Congress uh, the, the, uh, in the USA Patriot Act and in subsequent amendments, uh, is one such attempt. It expanded the notion of uh, terrorist crimes to areas that you would not think uh, 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 to be the, 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 uh, the, the, the Congress would uh, expand to or that the Constitution would not protect. And by this, I mean earlier stages uh, the, and more expansive areas uh, the, of uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, conduct or alleged criminal uh, conduct. Uh, so for example, the material uh, support statute was amended to uh, include, uh, to prohibit expert advice and assistance, uh, uh, a fairly ambiguous, uh, the, the ambiguous uh, the, uh, the word, but you know, but uh, uh, has been further defined to the, to include things like advocacy uh, the, and personnel. And, and so, if I go and fight for Al Qaeda, I not only would violate uh, the, the what, uh, whatever terrorist statutes for joining Al Qaeda, I would also violate the material support statute by providing my own personnel uh, the, uh, the, to, to uh, uh, the Al Qaeda. And as you as I describe it, you can start seeing, gee, you start looking at activities that are well antecedent to uh, the, the, an actual terrorist crime and much broader than. Uh, the, 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 the terrorist crimes, uh, activities that I, uh, I would, uh, I think is fairly characterized as inchoate, uh, more inchoate activities uh, that traditionally we would not uh, the criminalize, or if we do criminalize, we subject to significant constitutional the, uh, the, uh, scrutiny. Uh, but such as this, that's the attempt by Congress in order to expand the domestic uh, crime paradigm in order to uh, the meet the prevention uh, uh, imperative after the uh, after 9/11, so we worked ourselves to humanitarian law project versus Holder, which is a very long-standing case that preceded 9/11, uh, has been in the courts forever, uh, and up and down the Ninth Circuit, up and down the United States Supreme Court, finally reaching the the, uh, the point as to challenging the constitutionality, both on vagueness and First <coughs> Amendment grounds, of these prohibitions uh, the, of what I call for shorthand inchoate uh, the, and expansive inchoate the, uh, the activities. Uh, the, and the court, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision, uh, I think everybody agrees that these are, that these, these are not constitutionally, uh, uh, unconstitutionally vague. So the most interesting uh, part of the decision is the 6-3 division over the First Amendment protected, the, uh, First Amendment protected activities. And here it gets really, really interesting because the, uh, the, the activities, let's take one example. One of the activities that was, that was prosecuted uh, the, in this particular case uh, was the humanitarian law project's attempt to provide advocacy and advice to the, the, the uh, designated uh, uh, foreign terrorist organizations so that they can use peaceful means to achieve their end. Right, so let's just you know, so let's just posit that, that all they wanted to do is help these guys to adopt a better way of political advocacy. You know, lay down your arms, take up the law, uh, the, the, because war is better effectuated uh, by peaceful and legal means uh, the, rather than by the, uh, terrorist means. By any stretch of the imagination, that's not only benign product, uh, the, the conduct but normally constitutionally protected the, 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 the conduct. The Supreme Court nevertheless says that that is, that is constitutionally, uh, 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 it is constitutional for Congress to uh, uh, criminalize uh, such conduct. Uh, why is that? Because the Supreme Court says that such conduct, even though benign on their face and in their application, is fungible uh, the, in terms of the, the uh, the frees up resources uh, for the terrorist group 
uh, from uh, the, uh, the engaging in uh, no, what normally would be uh, 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 would be a legitimate activity into terrorist activity. So if they, uh, if you have lawyers uh, helping you to petition the United States nation to the uh, to talk to the New York Times and other like-minded uh, uh, organizations, uh, then you won't have as many people uh, the, the engaging in terrorist activity and uh, pursuing terrorist uh, uh, terrorist crimes. Uh, and that's the basis through which the government uh, the asserted and the Supreme Court uh, uh, accepted. Uh, the uh, uh, the fit between the between the uh, between the prohibition uh, and the compelling governmental interest in preventing uh, 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 terrorist activity. Whatever the definition of fungibility, uh, I think it is. I think the dissent, I mean, the opinion written by Justice Breyer, uh, is right to say that you know there are a lot of things that are fungible. Money being the easiest one. Uh, safe houses, uh, property, uh, a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things that can be uh, fungible. You know, weapons would be fungible. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Uh, uh, but when you're talking about personal services, it's hard to see the fungibility uh, the, 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 uh, the, the analysis simply because personal services are directed at a, at a specific activity and therefore cannot be diverted and, and it's easily monitored uh, uh, to make sure that it is not diverted uh, into uh, the, the illegal or constitutionally unprotected uh, uh, the activities. And in any event, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the dissent asserted that really what the Supreme Court was saying was applying intermediate scrutiny uh, of the type blessed by United States versus O'Brien rather than the strict scrutiny that it professes uh, to apply to this, uh, uh, to, this type of, uh, uh, to this type of conduct. So far, so good. Still a straightforward, uh, uh, still a straightforward story of the law and order conservatives uh, on the, the, the on the court versus your traditional uh, uh, the, uh, 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 criminal process liberals uh, on the court. With Justice Kennedy, of course, deciding in this case that national security uh, trumps free speech, so therefore that gives you the, that gives you the full vote and uh, uh, to be or not to, to be. That's how Hamlet comes out, and so therefore we, uh, uh, that's how the case comes down. Uh, unexplained, however, and much more interesting uh, from my perspective is Justice Stevens' vote, which gives the sixth vote in the 6-3 uh, uh, majority. How can, uh, how can any self-respecting liberal join this type of abomination, not only the First Amendment, but, over, but also an ex incredible expansion <coughs> of the state's criminal law power uh, uh, over the, uh, the uh, uh, protected activities and, uh, uh, and uh, of all people, all the lawyers who are now, who are now terrorists? Uh, under this uh, the, under this law, and not only any self-respecting person, uh, the very well-respected and uh, other the, the regard uh, in many other regards as the leader of the, the uh, of the, the um, attempt to circumscribe executive power with respect to uh, the, uh, uh, t uh, and in spite of assertions of compelling governmental interest to uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, terrorism, and so I guess w there are two ways one can look at. Uh, and try to explain Justice Stevens' uh, uh, vote. Uh, one is that a more parochial way and a more personal way is uh, uh, to track back his uh, uh, the voting record and see that you know that uh, he actually has a quirky status uh, uh, position on these types of uh, uh, controversy. He wrote a very strong dissent in the Texas v. Johnson uh, flag burning case, uh, uh, for example, arguing that it was o the O'Brien standard that applied conduct, not speech. Uh, because uh, the, 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 uh, the, the statute there did not seek to criminalize the, uh, the viewpoint, that is anti-American uh, uh, the viewpoint, but rather the means through which uh, uh, the Johnson would express this viewpoint by burning uh, uh, the symbol of our, the, the, of our polity. Uh, and so in that sense, you can say, well, this is just an expression of that, uh, uh, the, of that the, uh, the, uh, the quirky uh, the, uh, uh, strand of his jurisprudence. Uh, but you know, I'm not sure that that entirely explains it because the court, uh, this majority opinion, on the way to validating the government position in this case, took the diametrically opposing view uh, as to the applicability of the O'Brien standard. The court flatly rejected Justice Stevens' uh, position espousing his dissent in Texas v. Johnson. So at the very least, even if he agrees with the result, he would, uh, the, the, he would as he normally does, uh, write a sentence or two saying that the, uh, 
uh, I, uh, I reached this result, and I concur in the judgment of the court uh, because I think that the O'Brien standard uh, applies rather than the giving the court license to adopt a standard that to which he vigorously dissented uh, the, in the 19, uh, in the 1990s. And in any event, you know, Texas v. Johnson burning a flag in peaceful times is quite different from, and I think Justice uh, Stevens would appreciate the time and tenor of a the first terrorist challenge to a post 9/11 uh, 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 criminal statute uh, that uh, 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 seems to suggest many things to, uh, 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 to come with respect to the uh, criminal law paradigm. So then, how does one uh, how does one uh, generalize his vote? And and I I would submit one can and one can also generalize a uh, a uh, 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 jurisprudence that is uh, uh, quite consistent <coughs> with the, the uh, uh, liberal <coughs> approach, or uh, how should I say it, uh, the, a, a Scalia approach uh, the, the, the to the war on terror. That is, uh, that is simply put, it is perfectly consistent for one to be restrictive <coughs> of the president's authority under the, the uh, law of war paradigm, uh, the, and to be expansive for the president uh, the, the, uh, uh, in recognizing the president's authority under the criminal <coughs> law of war paradigm. Indeed, it's not only consistent, I would argue that it is necessary uh, for one to adopt the uh, adopt such an expansive uh, such an expansive view. The, pro the, the, the reasoning behind that is simply uh, that there is a prevention imperative, and the the governmental interest uh, in preventing terrorist the, the, the attack at this time in our polity is indeed very compelling, uh, and should just like other the, uh, all the laws but one type of uh, justifications uh, the, during wartime should take significant. Uh, 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 should uh, take significant precedent and 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 be the, uh, the given significant uh, the deference, and I think Justice Stevens' vote uh, the, is an implicit recognition uh, of this. That is, the more I try to uh, assert my uh, constitutional vision that the right way to deal with this is through the criminal law paradigm and not through a whole new law of war paradigm uh, the, 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 to unfettered uh, executive detention. Uh, then I have to make the space within the criminal law paradigm to allow for more robust assertions of political authority and governmental authority to detain uh, uh, suspects and to criminalize conduct and to protect the, uh, the and to protect the, uh, the the society from this ongoing terrorist uh, uh, threat. Uh, to circumscribe both halves uh, the the. the uh, uh, of the, the, the of the attempt to the prevent terrorist uh, the activity and respond to the terrorist threat would be essentially to make the entire constitution into you know what is the colloquially and the, I think un, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the unsuccessful uh, the, the term as a suicide pact because you would be constraining governmental power to deal with terrorism uh, at all rather a more pragmatic and more uh, 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 liberal and more uh, liberating approach would be to recognize that we will give ample space to the political branches for the nation uh, to extend its authority to activities that in all honesty really should not be crimes and would not be constitutionally, uh, constitutionally permissible uh, the, to be criminalized and prosecuted except for with, an, uh, with a compelling and I would argue overwhelmingly compelling governmental interest in uh, the, uh, preventing terrorist attacks and uh, responding to terrorists, uh, the responding to terrorist threats. In that, in that sense, uh, I think it is consistent with and part of uh, his and Justice Scalia's continuing attempt to look at the the, the, uh, the structures of government and the institutions established by our the, uh, by our constitution, so as to give uh, the, the, the criminal suspect the full panoply of uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, and fourteenth amendment uh, uh, rights, even if they are terrorist suspects. Uh, but recognizing that the application of those rights, uh, including the First Amendment, uh, may have to, uh, to give way to the, the, uh, the uh, overriding paradigm of preventing another terrorist attack. Forgive me. Uh, forgive me about that. I've got some prepared mark remarks, and they might be easier to deliver that on, on that basis. So I want to thank Professor Din and the Ryan Centre and my friend and colleague Rob Miller for the opportunity to respond to Professor Din's thought-provoking paper. I had the benefit of an outline of his remarks uh, in, in advance. I'm going to address some of the issues it raises from two perspectives. One informed by what I will provisionally call the subject position of a constitutionalist 
the other generated by the confluence of scholarly interests in comparative law and constitutional law that Professor Din and I share. I'll start and end, however, with some brief reflections on what we might learn from studying the constitutional commitments of two justices of constitutional courts of final jurisdiction, both relatively recently retired. The first of these, obviously, is Justice Stevens, who in some, I think, profound sense animated uh, Professor Din's paper. The latter is Justice Michael Kirby, the great dissenter, recently retired from Australia's High Court. But perhaps a point of explication of what I mean by a constitutionalist perspective is in order here uh, and particularly today. It has occurred to me as with constitutionally estranged eyes, I regard the rainbow, sorry, the ragtail rainbow caravan, one cannot um, with a straight face call it a coalition of originalisms proliferating in the US constitutional law pantheon that you or constitutionalism know you are in trouble when Jack Balkan and Adnan Scalia both call themselves originalists, albeit both with what might one, one might take either to be a taste for mischief or in cynical bad faith. So perhaps in the US we are indeed all constitutionalists now um, and perhaps because of this I'm going to depart from that paradigm and use the term constitutionalist rather than the more descriptive term radical originalist to describe a position that understands constitutions to be characterised both and always by the provision of a structure for the exercise of state power on the one hand and by placing constraints on that power including through what we would call, I think, guaranteeing rights on the other. A constitutionalist also understands that these two foundational aspects of constitutionalism inevitably exert pulls upon each other and demand what Jacques Derrida called present judging. What of Justice Stevens? Professor Din identifies in the justice's work on the war on terror uh, cases a commitment to what is called the criminal law paradigm for addressing the constitutionally challenging question of, of terrorism. I'd put, I think we agree about a lot of things, but I'd, I'd quite like to frame uh, the, the approach to Justice Stevens I'm going to take here a little bit differently. In authoring Razul, joining both Justice Scalia's concurrence in Hamdi and an opinion for the court in Bermedienne that both Stephen Vladek and I have recently suggested marks a tentative shift from the current etiolated state of federal courts theorizing Article III power, Justice Stevens demonstrates a singular understanding of constitutionalism. His membership of the majority in Holder and Humanitarian Project, where both sides grapple with the tensions between constitutionalism's state maintaining and guaranteed functions, is utterly consistent, I want to suggest, with the adjudicative practice in constitutional cases of a seasoned and thoughtful member of the third arm of government, who also knows only too well from searing family experience, what it means to be on the receiving end of state power. Many of you will know, of course, that Justice Stevens's idyllic childhood was interrupted when his father and his uncle were both, uh, were, were both charged with, uh, with white collar offences. His father was eventually acquitted. His uncle suicided under the pressure of the prosecution. Um, I think that's something that clearly, for me at least, animates his uh, criminal procedural and his constitutional um, uh, decision making. As well as an orientation to the figure of Justice Stevens, there was a strong thread of recognition of the salience of comparative institutional competence considerations running through Professor Din's remarks. This is, of course, characteristic of many accounts, particularly legal process accounts, of what resources one should draw on in adjudicating constitutional law claims. It's also an especially apt position to adopt in reflections on Holder, as Professor Din did, where both opinions grapple with precisely that subject. There is much in addition to what Professor Din has already suggested that might be said about the Holder opinions. But let me just register here that the dissent in particular is tragically anachronistic, willfully blind, to use its own language, um, to context, fraught with the impoverishment of contemporary distinctively legal constitutional discourse in the US as to paradigms apt to address terrorism in constitutional adjudication. There are more radical questions about what the challenges contemporary practices of terrorism posed to constitutionalism might be than those which US, US constitutional lawyers, whether making law and policy, 
and or casting an evaluative gaze upon it from the academy currently characteristically engage. Here, a couple of points of divergence, modest divergence, I think, between Professor Din's perspective and mine are perhaps worth flagging. The first relates to constitutionalism, the second to a perspective that is at once explicitly comparativist and distinctly constitutional. While Holder is indeed the first Supreme Court consideration of the use of the criminal justice paradigm in the war on terror, our lower courts are suffused with these cases at present, with far-ranging and, on my assessment, presently dimly comprehended consequences for constitutionalism. And while for us in the US, the war on terror might be understood, as Pro Professor Din writes, to present unique circumstances, US constitutional lawyers practicing academic or hybrid apparent lack of clarity as to how to apply Youngstown and its ilk in tackling the new and difficult issues presented by contemporary terrorism is not assisted, I want to suggest, either by the impoverishment of contemporary US constitutional law paradigms, nor yet by the persistent failure, for example, to consider how more or less identical issues have been addressed by the British and Irish legal systems, proximately in the Irish Troubles, and also in their antecedents, in the latter of which, originalists of different stripes of my, my, my own, such as it is, might find ample food for thought, which has particular resonances in a university whose present location owes itself to anti-Catholic violence, albeit wielded by violent aggregations of individuals, rather than coming in the form of legalized state oppression. Let me tease out those two themes. Constitutionalist, comparative constitutional lawyers. I am a rights, both discourse and paradigm skeptic. As such, let me distance myself, as I have suggested we should dissociate Justice Stevens from criminal justice paradigm romantics. Those of you who have visited the Liberty Bell exhibition in Philadelphia will recall the caption in the exhibit, which notes that at one point in the Bell's peripatetic history, it was housed on one floor of a building that elsewhere accommodated a federal district court that was enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. And let me bring to mind, too, the haunting image in that same exhibition of an enslaved man incarcerated in a slave collar surmounted by a bell in this iteration, one that might alert his owner of an escape. Context is perhaps everything um, as we bring our constitution into meaning, and I think that's a point Professor Din and I have in common. Further, one attentive to constitutionalism might characterize Justice Stevens' record in the post 9-11 cases as turning not on questions of which of two paradigms is apt when the three branches of government struggle with terrorism, but rather on questions of structural constitutional principles of the kind central, for example, to Ely's representation reinforcement theory of constitutional interpretation, or others that go deeper. Limited government is what I have in mind here, or a commitment to the rule of law. What do we do as constitutionalists when the paradigms, the two that we have, don't fit? American practicing constitutional discourse is notoriously hostile turf for what often passes as comparative constitutional law within it. Border raids for so-called authority of the kind excoriated sometimes with cause by Justice Scalia. Like an awareness that this is not the first time or the only place in a fundamentally shared constitutional history that the phenomenon of terrorism has challenged constitutionalism. The comparative constitutional law literature has some important cont contributions to make about debates on, uh, uh, about such matters as what I take to be the heart of the most likely constitutional crisis in this nation's immediate future how legal institutions and actors within them should address the phenomenon of indefinite preventive detention on US soil. I am thinking here of Oren Gross's 2003 Yale Law Journal article, Chaos and Rules, Should Responses to Violent Crises Always Be Constitutional? And Cardozo Comparative Constitutional Law Scholar Michelle Rosenfeld's 2006 article, Judicial Balancing in Times of Stress, Compar comparing the Ameri American, British, and Israeli uh, approaches to the war on terror. 
What these two pieces make clear is that the binary paradigm of law of war and criminal justice excludes both a capacious middle ground and critical marginal perspectives. Perhaps we should all be comparative constitutionalists now, or perhaps if we are constitutionalists, we always already are. And if we are, we might usefully pay attention to what Michael Kirby wrote in a 2004 High Court indefinite detention case, Faden, one in a series of dissents theorising Chapter 3 judicial power, the Australian analogue of Article 3 power. And those of you who know the Australian constitutional system will know that the Australian framers made the choice to base their document on the US Constitution. And I'm quoting Michael Kirby here. History evidences many patterns of unacceptable intrusions by other sources of power into the independence of the judiciary. These should not be dismissed as irrelevant to Australia. They have occurred in highly civilised countries with strong legal and judicial traditions. One pattern of intrusion into judicial functions may be observed in what occurred in Germany in the early 1930s. It was provided for in the acts of an elected government. Laws with retroactive effect were duly promulgated. Such laws, and they were criminal laws, adopted a phenomenological approach. Punishment was addressed to the character of the criminal instead of the proved facts of the crime and meted out on criminal archetypes, those who harmed the nation. In the Communist Party case, Justice Dixon taught the need for this court to keep its eye on history, so far as it illustrated the overreach of governmental power. I dissent from the willingness of this court, having stated the principle of judicial independence of Chapter 3 courts now repeatedly to lend its authority to its confinement. This has been done virtually to the point where the principle itself has disappeared at the very time when the need for it has greatly increased. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tin will now make a brief reply and then we'll take questions. It is not a reply, it's just a commendation. I think that the, uh, the Professor Pether has actually the, uh, the, the put into context uh, the, my the very crude and uh, the, the, the background analysis uh, the very, very well. So I very much appreciate that. I also appreciate her coining of the, the phrase criminal law of romantic. I think that's, uh, the, that's the first time I've heard of that, uh, I've heard of that particular slight <laughs> against, any, against anybody. Um, yes, I think we should all be comparative law, the, uh, a comparative constitutionalist. And just give me, a, I'll give you a very, very uh, quick example, a very practical level uh, 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 as to the, the genesis of this kind of, uh, this kind of problem. Right after 9-11, as we were working through the USA Patriot Act, I got a call from uh, a senior Canadian uh, uh, official, my counterpart in Canada, and said, uh, how close are you? I said, we're close, we're almost done. And he says, uh, the, the, well, I think we're going to get preventive detention in. Did you? And I said, huh? And I said, yeah, I think we're going to get a two-year preventive dis the detention uh, the, 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 the provision. And I said, hum me a few more bars. <laughs> and, and, and he says, you know, two years administrative designation we, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the is the current proposal. And I said, huh? You know, and he says, no, you, you should look at what they're doing in the UK. And which is the Anti-Terrorism Security Act, and there was the, the, it was already passed as a one-year uh, administrative the, 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 the detention upon just simple certification by the, the uh, by the executive uh, the, by the executive branch. We, of course, I mean, I was just so high bound by our constitutional the, uh, the, 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 the paradigms or way of thinking that I really couldn't uh, uh, fathom it, although it is a very significant uh, uh, the issue and a very significant tool within, uh, uh, within counterterrorism. And we know the French and Italians uh, the, the have solved the problem because they are civil law societies and under the civil law system can have preventive detention. Uh, indeed, the, the uh, European Charter for Human Rights makes an ex explicit exception uh, for such uh, domestic law, and that's, that law was very used very, very well by uh, Judge Bruguier <laughs> and Judge uh, Cataro and, and others in breaking the backs of both the, the, uh, the, the mafia in Italy and the Algerian uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, terrorism in, the, the, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in France. Uh, but common law countries do not have that type of similar the, uh, civil law the, the history. Uh, the you know, obviously, uh, the, the unbeknownst to me, uh, but in a separate uh, the track, the, 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 the 
the justifications for you know, wartime detention uh, that was happening in Iraq and subsequently in, uh, uh, in uh, Guantanamo is one answer to that and obviously application of it to domestic arrestees uh, is uh, uh, the ultimate answer uh, uh, to it so that, uh, so that the, uh, uh, the, rule, the, the law of war detention becomes our version of ATSA, our version of the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Jack Yu, uh, the, uh, the policies in, uh, in France and, uh, and, in, uh, uh, and uh, in Italy. And uh, I, I would have benefited a bit more, I think, had I uh, been more comparativist at the, 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 uh, at the time. formulating uh, them, please recall, as always, that brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Boyd? Oh, hi. Really good presentation. Um, my, my, my first question, and I guess my only question, is what exactly is a terrorist? Because I, I, you know, I can think of like the KKK, I would call them terrorists, and I would call Timothy McVeigh a terrorist, and uh, those people who are in the woods training the militias and getting the guns, you know, I don't know what they are, but Timothy McVeigh was one of those folks. And it occurred to me, I think I heard this on the radio the, the, the other day, that terrorists have become highly coded, that where it's increasingly just kind of mostly Muslims, mostly Arabs, not always, but mostly Arabs. It's, very, it's kind of racially coded, it's religiously coded. And I wonder if you know we have this kind of special carving out of something for those people, and then it becomes all of us. I'm thinking of like racketeering, which used to go for the mob, and then it became like, all kinds of people engage in racketeering. So I just wonder about the perversion of our criminal justice system, which, you know, I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I can't say, but I, I can't believe that it can't work even in, in fact, this is the time we test it, and I, I'm, I'm really, I'm concerned. And I have to do international law, and I, I, I don't think the laws of war should apply either. So I'm concerned, and I'd like your work. Oh, let me start. So the definition itself is, uh, is there, but it, and, and, and because it's not a criminal definition, it's simply a, a supporting definition, it is ex exceedingly broad. Simply stated, it's, uh, and I, I have to, uh, I have to uh, recount, I think it's uh, 2339 mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, that says that terrorism uh, is the use of violent means to coerce a population or influence their own policy. Can we move along with that? To specific, uh, the, the, the context is really where the uh, the 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 the, the, nut, the, the nut, if it's the pedal or the rubber meets the road or whatever the, the, the cliche is, uh, and so that that in itself is very broad, and it's, but it's not illustrative of the criminal penalties. Uh, and so, for example, the material support statute only applies to the the the, 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 the easy e the, is, is most easily applied to in this case for terrorist organizations, which are designated under very uh, the, the the clear procedures under section. Uh, and so, and so there's separate, uh, different ways for us to, uh, for us to, uh, 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 to define it. But, uh, but you are right. Uh, the word the, the terrorism is, uh, the, or the definition of it is by necessity very, very broad. As a matter of uh, bastardizing the, the, the language, you know, I, I, you know I, I, at times I take the issue with the use of the war, the, of, the, of the phrase the war on, global war on terror. Uh, and I think in, in many cases it can be, uh, it can be overused into, you know, into describing everything, uh, and so therefore rightly criticized. But you know, make no mistake about it, this is not a fake war like the war on poverty or the war on drugs. I mean, this is, you know, there, at the end of the day, and the beginning of the day, there was an act of war, and there is a war response. The real question is what are the parameters and the rules applicable to that war on terror? When should we apply the, the, uh, the uh, uh, laws of war or not do the, uh, the oversimplification and saying that no, this is not a war on terror, like you say, because at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the,
was the first thing I did when I saw I'd moved from the other part of my brain into the middle part of it. And co-ed offence has got a long history, right? Attempts, solicitation, conspiracy. Um, and they're, and that they're, they're always compensable because what they did, they, the law enforcement is, is a whole lot of discretion to go after people they just don't like, right? Second point, I think you're absolutely right about how the term's been eroded. And the cases and statutes that I'm most familiar with on, on this issue are the Australian, the British, and the American, uh, and the American ones. And, and the Australian cases um, uh, give, a, in, it, well, there are three bodies of people who are present, presently being subjected to unusual preventive, quote unquote, preventive detention, or you could call it indefinite detention without trial. Those are quote unquote terrorists who, and who are precisely coded in Australia, in Britain, and here. Um, in, in Australia, too, there are a, a certain class of asylum seekers, and those are Islamic asylum seekers. And the third class is the sexually violent predator, right, in, in, in all three places. So there are these three groups of people we've, we've, we've started relatively recently to carve out, because I know asylum detention is, a, is an old thing, but indefinite asylum detention of the kind that's been practiced in Australia is not, right? Um, there is a group of people who we are carving out as not like us, right? And we are putting them in a third paradigm, whether we like it or not. And it's been interesting to watch the Australian and British courts struggle precisely with that question of what is it that we, that we ought to do. And what I'm horrified by, by when, for example, I read, you know, read what Lindsey, Lindsey Graham saying about, you know, the, the legislation, you know, he's authoring about, you know, to deal with preventive detention on US soil if we eventually close Gitmo, because there are some of them who are not going to be able to try in criminal courts, there are some of them who don't fit the law, law, law paradigm to begin with and do. Um, we're not, we're going to have to do something with them, right? Um, unless we can do what we did with the poor old Uyghurs, we sent them off to Albania or or Nauru, or whatever it was that we, we, we sent them. And we're not thinking deeply here. It's just like, I don't want them in my backyard. You know, let's shove them off to Northern Illinois somewhere. No one's thinking about the profound levels at which we need to take this seriously. Um, and when I, read the, when I read the dissent in the Humanitarian Law Project, I mean, it's so, it's so tragic. It's so thin, <coughs> right? These are really, really important issues. We need deeper thinking. We need a better vocabulary. And we need to understand who we're marginalising, right? And that that's got a very old history, right? Um, one that we should be really attentive to. That's a very good point regarding uh, regarding uh, asylum detention. I think the next wave after the New Zealand would be uh, uh, would be how to see it and value that applied mm -hmm. to uh, sort of non gitmo detainees mm -hmm. uh, who are being launched now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. some subset of cases you actually do go to Congress, you know, why don't you do a better job of actually writing the laws, making more clear, and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and solving some of these definitional or coding issues that we, 
that, that provides the grit for today's, uh, for, uh, for today's discussion. Uh, some of it may well be, you know, just oversight and conflict. I will, uh, I will give you that, uh, I will grant you that because of the, the few moments. But the overwhelming, of, I would say 95% of, of these things, definitional issues, uh, were deliberate, uh, 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 were deliberate, uh, uh, were left to be deliberately withdrawn. Uh, uh, and, and a bit of a punt to the courts uh, in order to uh, engage in interpretive, uh, uh, interpretive techniques in order to pull back as necessary, or simply because we do not know what context it would apply to, uh, to go ahead and, uh, and to go ahead and, and uh, give a broadly grip with the, uh, the, the uh, uh, FBI's broad powers to apply, and then where they go across, then uh, the constitutional challenge as a, uh, as a, uh, the, as a uh, defense. Uh, it's not a very heartening story of It's not libertarian. You're absolutely yeah, right. I mean, yeah. the 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 uh, honest services statute, for example, yeah. that's been in effect for the last 30 years, yeah. and, and you know the, the prosecutor's favorite tool, yeah. you know that was just invalidated or uh, or yeah. significantly restricted in upon the practice. Yeah, yeah. Per perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. But like what? Well, so Hans, I mean, I, I I thought I heard you say um, that you felt constitutionally high ground to not preserve the right of detention, and I thought I heard you sound like that was a bad thing. And I'm wondering whether that wasn't precisely what you were supposed to do in your role as an executive branch official, um, was in fact to feel constrained in some respects by the Constitution. Um, and and I, I think you said this in a pearl way, but I wonder if you could just, just talk a little bit about that, because um, unless we already treat the Constitution as just a scrap of paper during wartime, then it, then it has to be, uh, in fact, some level of which I think you acknowledge it was. But no, you didn't I, I, make it sound like it was a personal failing, and I would, I would, uh, would think it was praiseworthy to be hidebound by the Constitution, especially on its birthday. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, uh, to the extent that I gave you the uh, false impression that, uh, that I'm an authoritarian uh, uh, Nazi, uh, 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 I apologize. No, uh, the, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I uh, said uh, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
assume that we were engaged in a legal battle to the death with the Defense Department. So you know, it would take away a certain law board jurisdiction, take away our prisoners, and you know, and take away our primacy with respect to the domestic war on terror and trying to expand their foreign role into the domestic context. So let's assume that we think that their role is violating proper comitatus, which is a horrible one for our society and our constitution. Speaking only hypothetically, of course, how would we craft a law within the criminal law context in order to allow for the practical needs of that are presented by the fight against terrorism and still be consistent with our criminal law context? It's only in part. You don't achieve everything. So why is it that you need, why is it that you need to prevent the detention or these types of extrajudicial, extracriminal law detentions? One is the speed of the charge, right? There is a speedy trial act requirement. Two is the use of the evidence, the confrontation clause, right? Because the evidence may come from classified sources or from sources that are still ongoing that you would not want to present in court yet. And then three, what is now very clearly touted is essentially the intelligence value, which is code for the ability to interrogate without a lawyer there telling them not to talk. And so those are the three, those are the three sort of like law enforcement or intelligence, the governmental interests that really these types of detention are seeking to, that are seeking to go forward. There are not many, there are not many ways for you to satisfy those interests without running afoul of the Constitution within the criminal law paradigm. Confrontation clause, you know, Judge Brinkman in the 20th Bomb case, you know, worked out some novel solutions there. So that can be gotten around so that there can be a constitutional challenge, whether it's held on appeal to another judge is a debate. Speedy trial act is hard, but you know, not, you know, not, not insurmountable. At least you can get six, you know, through extensions and the like, you can get through the six months, but at least there's a finite period there, so it's not too great. The intelligence aspect, you know, the access to counsel and the interrogation aspect, you know, is a very, very, very important one, but it's very, very hard, very hard to solve. I think the latest attempt, the latest suggestion from a criminal, criminal law romantic is Eric Holder, who really wants to, I think, in part because he wants to establish the primacy, the primacy, if not exclusivity of the criminal law paradigm and recognizes that it needs to be somehow expanded in order to take care of these very strong presenting interests is the public safety exception to this panoply of law. Maybe that'll work, maybe it won't, but those are the kinds of, those are the kind of, I think, practical thinking that has to go into that. But I can fully agree with you, the Constitution is there for us, for all of us to celebrate and abide by, especially in the hardest of times, because it's easy to be a sunny day constitution. Any questions on McLaughlin? Yeah, I'm surprised by your answer, because I would think that the main reason that you couldn't bring the detention powers into the criminal justice system is that the object is completely different, and you don't have the same underlying logic. The object of the criminal justice system, as you've defined it constitutionally, is to punish acts. We teach first year students that status is not a criminal offense. Every time we back into status-like offenses, including our sexual predators, we get very nervous, as we should, because it violates deeply ingrained constitutional values and actually violates some express provision of the Constitution. By contrast, as far as I can tell, the Constitution is absolutely silent on the question of military detention. It has nothing to say on the issue, and we have reconciled this as a distinct arena of the laws of war, and the laws of war have always addressed themselves to status, not to acts. Indeed, it is under the terms of Geneva, it is impermissible to prosecute under domestic law soldiers for acts that would otherwise be criminal. The problem we have is we are conducting a war on terror, and we are not doing it in a way that is consistent with the principles of the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you.
combating a force that engages in warlike activity but without any of the normal trappings of war. They have their uniforms, they have brandished weapons at their side, they target rather than, fail, than simply fail to protect the civilian population and they come onto our shores where the acts would otherwise be treatable as, as criminal acts. So they fall betwixt and between. And I think that the main problem is that many of these people, but for the fact that they don't wear arms and they don't wear uniforms and they don't pledge allegiance to a state with which we have a capacity to hack our way out of war, but for all those, they would be soldiers. They engage in firefights with our troops. They come and they try to, to damage our national infrastructure. These are acts of war. And the way that we have treated warriors, including on domestic soil during the Civil War, was not through a criminal law paradigm, but through the laws of war. The Lieber Code emerges from our response to the fact of having to fight on our own soil against our own brothers. So I, I think that the main problem is that we use the term constitution as a stand-in for the whole body of law that has emerged in different situations response to different exigencies. And it turns out the Constitution has very little to say as such on the question of an administrative detention hospital. If there were an army that invaded our soil, one would be lunatic to try to start prosecuting tens of thousands of soldiers and to go up to them because they happen to have come in through Michigan and say the first thing we want to tell you is you have the right to remain silent. Uh, <laughs> so it would not be part of the activity. You would try to kill them, to disable them. You don't start collecting evidence, the chain of custody bags. And when we try to apply that in Afghanistan, it breaks down. When we try to apply that anywhere. You put people in Guantanamo, I'm sorry to say, only because we know what to do about this. Guantanamo is not Cuba. Come on. It's a, it's a Cuban government issue. So this is a hard problem, and I think that it's not criminal law. It would be acts of war if we had an enemy that played by the rules of war. And to, 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 to reify the Constitution and say this is, it's, it's already been resolved, I think is, is, a, is, a, is, is a hopeless act. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I take your comment, and I take it as clarifying of my, of my position. I sort of, I start with the presumption uh, with, with the assumption that everybody knows that I believe in the, the, in the constitutionality of the law of war detention. I mean, so, and, so, and so in many ways, I'm trying to uh, explain the context of the criminal law, the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, detention uh, paradigm has is also being coexisted uh, with that so that we do not need to, uh, uh, to resort to the, the law of war detention as much as we have, uh, uh, have had. And so the, the president would be able to wear the, the bow tie. I do think that the president should be and is constitutionally uh, the real, the, the really hard question, and it may well be uh, the, an establishment of a new Article One court, particularly in Article Two, uh, the, somehow in order to uh, uh, the adjudicate these types of fair, fairly special cases, which are, you know, uh, American soil type of detentions uh, the, of the, the Amari and the, the Padilla type of uh, uh, type of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the categories uh, that will that will obviate the need for. Before we thank our speakers and before we take our break, I would remind you, uh, as Professor Miller said, we will recommence at 1025 promptly. Professor Blasey will begin speaking at 1025, so if you would 
to come back into the room before 20, uh, 1025 so as to avoid interrupting. That would be great. Please join me in a round of thanks to our